Hi, Dr. Doug Lucas here, retired orthopedic surgeon now focusing my practice on longevity and bone health. Have you been told that eating meat is bad for your bones? What if I told you that that was a lie? And either a misunderstanding or a complete misrepresentation of the science to push a vegan agenda and remove meat from our food supply. So stay tuned to learn why the alkaline diet theory and body pH is probably not as important as you think it is and why avoiding acid forming foods like meat is probably not the answer to solving your bone health problem. So I see recommendations all over the place to raise your body pH, avoid acid, to avoid every chronic disease from diabetes, heart disease, osteoporosis, and more. Typically, this recommendation coincides with a call to remove meat from your diet. But like all things with nutrition, there is a lot of nuance to this discussion. And without understanding the science, it's really easy to take this information out of context and to potentially do more harm than good. So we're gonna review the basics of pH, what an acid forming food really is and what those foods really are, where this theory originated, what foods are really acidic versus what foods are acid forming, and what the actual human literature shows us regarding how this impacts our bodies. And then finally, actually how to put these principles into play when it comes to your diet. Just a warning, if you are a vegan or vegetarian, this is going to challenge your belief system. But like everything in nutrition, if you are trying to eat a diet for a specific purpose, I strongly encourage you to have an open mind and to always look with scrutiny at what you're eating and whether or not it is going to actually serve you or if you're just choosing to eat something based off of a belief system, which unfortunately removes all objectivity out of nutrition. So first we need to define acidic. We are talking about pH. So pH is a scientific term and it's a little bit hard to explain, but basically pH is a scale and on the low end of the scale is acidic and on the high end of the scale is alkaline. Now extremes in either end are not good, but just like if you've ever measured a pH of a pool, for example, if you take a strip of paper, dip it in, it'll tell you how acidic it is and you can either add acid to bring the pH down or you can add a base to make it more alkaline and raise it up. So in theory, we can do the same thing with food, although probably not as much as you think. Now the next thing to consider is what is acidic versus what is an acid forming food. So there's a lot of confusion here, so let me just explain the difference. So if a food is acidic, like for example, a lemon is a very acidic food, and if you take a strip of pH paper and you put it on a lemon, it will indeed be acidic. But when you consume it, it actually has a net alkaline effect on your body. How is that? Well, similarly, there are acid forming foods. So if you consider things like meat and dairy are the most commonly cited, but also other things like sugar, alcohol, and some grains, they can have a net acid forming effect on your body, even though if you were to take that same strip of pH paper and put it on the meat or on the dairy, then they would not be acidic outside of your body, but we're talking about the net effect inside your body. So there's a difference between an acidic food which can actually be alkaline versus an acid forming food, which is not necessarily acidic to begin with. I think it's important too that we understand that acidic is not necessarily bad. It sounds bad. We just have a, or at least I do, a visceral response to the word acidic it just sounds dangerous. But we have to understand too that alkaline is potentially just as toxic on the other end of the spectrum. And there are examples where acid and our body are actually really good. So for example, our stomach acid is extremely acidic of a pH of around one if your stomach is healthy. And that is critical for actually digesting protein, for absorbing calcium, and many, many other things that your body requires for metabolism. So just like an acid isn't necessarily bad for your stomach or your body, although it might be bad for your teeth, meat and other acid forming foods are not necessarily bad for your body either and they are definitely not necessarily bad for your bones. All we are simply saying when we say a, an acid forming food is that the chemical reaction associated with that food because of the chlorine, the phosphorus, the nitrogen or whatever it is on there that your body has to have an acidic buffering process to digest and metabolize 
that's all we're talking about when we talk about acidic forming foods, but then that concept can be taken out of context when you look at the literature. So why would somebody take this out of context? Well, it becomes pretty clear when you look at the list of potential acid forming foods versus the list of potential alkaline forming foods or alkalizing foods. So the list of acid forming foods includes, like I said, meat, it includes dairy, and the list of alkalizing foods includes fruits and vegetables. So clearly you can see if somebody has a belief system that they're trying to push and they want people to consume one side or the other, potentially you could leverage this research, depending on what it says, to encourage people to do one or the other or use it to support and enforce your own belief system. However, if you look at the list of acid forming foods, it's not just meat and dairy, it's also sugar, it's also alcohol, and it's also some grains. So arguably, our standard American diet, or now the standard worldwide diet, actually fits a lot into this box of acid forming foods. So is the standard American diet potentially bad for our bones? We'll see. So the theory goes like this. If you are consuming an acid forming food or potentially even an acidic food and you don't understand the science behind it, you could make the case that these acid forming foods are going to cause the body to be acidic. Now, the problem with this is that outside of places like the operating room or places like the intensive care unit or the ICU in the hospital, it's really hard to measure body pH or arterial blood pH, for example. However, I can tell you based on my experience as an orthopedic surgeon that you can measure these things in the ICU and in the operating room. And when we are measuring these things, dietary intake will have negligible, if any effect whatsoever, on the actual pH of the blood in the body and therefore the body pH. If you feed a patient in the ICU a steak while they have an arterial line in, their pH is not gonna go down. Now, if that patient starts to have an issue breathing and they can't breathe off CO2, or if their kidneys go into failure for whatever reason, then you can see a change in their arterial or their blood pH, and that is actually an emergency. Outside of those settings in the hospital, the operating room and the ICU, really the only way we can measure pH is through urine. So if you use a pH strip and you test your urine, you can identify whether or not your urine is more acidic or more alkaline. But you have to understand what you're testing. All you're testing is your kidneys ability to buffer or change the pH of what's going in to maintain a very tightly controlled window of pH in the blood. So all you're looking at really in urine pH is the effect of your kidney to then buffer uh, pH from all kinds of different things. And our body has the ability to use our kidneys, our lungs, our muscles, and our bones, but using our bones would be the last case scenario. And what we find in the literature is that we don't really use our bones to buffer pH, even though we could, we don't, because it would sort of be like chopping up your furniture to throw it in the fireplace to heat your house in the winter. You have you have wood for that or gas for that. You're not gonna use something that you need, something that's gonna support your structure and your lifestyle. Our bodies are much smarter than that. But regardless of the obviousness of the weakness of this theory, the theory is still pushed forward and it goes like this. If you have an acid forming food and you consume it and you can prove that your urine is acidic, then your body must be acidic and you are breaking down your bones, which causes osteoporosis. That's a, an interesting theory, but all theories should be proven by literature whenever possible. So is there literature to support that theory? Mm, there is some, let's go through it. All right, thanks so much for listening to this video. If you are enjoying this content, please like, subscribe, and sign up for notifications. If you know anybody that would benefit from this information, please share this with them. And lastly, if you wanna learn more about how we manage bone health and other tips and tricks you can do on your own, look for the link for our masterclass in the description below. All right, so let's talk about the literature. So when I dug into this topic, I was really curious about where this came from because intuitively it didn't really make sense to me. What I found is the authors that were talking about this that did cite studies, they were citing animal studies from relatively long time ago, which is fine. Animal studies are very important. 
But we have to remember that animal studies are really only designed to prove a hypothesis and then you have to move that forward to other potentially other animals before we get to humans but eventually human studies to really say yes you can extrapolate this information from animal studies what they found is that a high protein diet fed to either mice or rats i don't remember which one it will cause increased acidity of the urine but also a decrease in bone mineral density so there is evidence to say hey a high protein diet is bad for your bones but if you then repeat that study and give those animals an adequate calcium diet in combination with a high protein diet then they protect their bones and the calcium that they pee out that they're using to buffer the acid is coming from their diet not from their bones so you could potentially extrapolate that theory to say well as long as you're consuming adequate calcium you don't need to worry about the protein and i think that would be an oversimplification of the research so what about human studies well i've pulled up a number of human studies to review but let me just give a uh, a little bit of information about these types of studies so while you can do good intervention studies in animals particularly small animals it is really hard to do that in humans because to have enough humans enrolled in a study and to put them in a controlled enough environment would be tremendously expensive and nobody's going to fund that study so typically when we're looking at studies on nutrition we're looking at epidemiology which has all kinds of issues and all kinds of flaws it doesn't mean that it's completely pointless but it is challenging to glean good information out of so when we're looking at epidemiological studies we really have to look at it through the lens of okay is there a signal is that signal consistent and how big is it because there are some associations which you can get out of epidemiologic studies there are some associations that are so obvious that we don't need to do further intervention studies a great example of that would be smoking and lung cancer the association between smoking and lung cancer was so strong there was never an intervention study to prove that smoking caused lung cancer it was obvious so when we look at literature and nutrition we need to see is it consistent is there a signal and does it make sense it would be great if we could then prove it through an intervention trial but that's pretty rarely done in this space one more thing i want to mention about looking at meat eaters versus non-meat eaters and nutrition so there is this principle called the healthy user bias and this is something that has been a challenge in the meat literature for decades because when you divide out vegetarians and vegans versus meat eaters the people that are choosing and following a vegetarian or vegan diet are likely also choosing other healthy lifestyles. So they are generally smoking less, they're exercising more, they're prioritizing sleep, they're prioritizing stress management. Whereas the meat eaters, they may be eating a healthy diet, but more likely they're probably eating a crappy standard American diet, not prioritizing sleep, drinking more, smoking more, and doing other less healthy activities. So then you can try with statistical analysis to separate those things out, but it's really hard to do that realistically. So we have to understand that there is a healthy user bias favoring, in this case, the vegan and vegetarian group, but we'll see that this literature actually pushes through that to show a benefit in eating meat. So the first study I wanna show you is a 2019 study that looked at over 20 different studies and they performed a meta-analysis on 37,000 individuals. What this study showed is that vegans and vegetarians had a lower bone mineral density, meaning that if you were to get a DEXA scan there, they have a more negative score than meat eaters. And they had, or at least the vegans had, an increased risk of fracture of 44% higher than the meat eaters. So there seems to be some signal there. So let's keep going. All right, so this next study is from 2020 and it is called the EPIC Oxford study. It is a study looking at over 55,000 people in 18 years of data. So pretty rigorous study. And they divided people into meat eaters, fish eaters, vegans, and vegetarians. And then they looked at really fracture risk is what they were talking about here. So the fracture risk was lowest in the meat eaters. It was similar, high, similarly higher in the fish eaters and vegetarians at about 25% increased risk. But the vegan group in this study had an over doubled risk of hip fracture. And that's a 2.31 hazard ratio, meaning that it was an over double the risk from baseline or meat eaters for the vegan group. 
and that's pretty significant. So the next study is a 2022 study from the United Kingdom, and this looked at vegetarians versus meat eaters. It did not separate out like the last study did the different types of vegetarians and potentially vegans, but they found that in general, there was a higher incidence of hip fracture, about 33% higher in this group overall. All right, so you might be thinking to yourself, well, we know that vegan and vegetarian diets tend to be a lower protein diet, so maybe it's just the protein, and maybe that's true. There's a Utah study that came out in 2004, and they were looking at a population in the state of Utah, and they were comparing quartiles of protein intake. So what that means is if you were to take the amount of protein that everybody's consuming and divide it up into four groups, lowest quarter, second lowest, second highest and highest, and then compare hip fractures over time, you can get an idea of if there is an association of protein consumption with hip fracture. And what this study showed is that the highest group, meaning the highest quartile, had the lowest fracture rate. And you could actually see this clear inverse relationship where the higher the protein intake was, the lower the risk of fracture was. And that can make sense. If you think about what protein does for the body, it helps you to maintain and improve muscle mass. Protein is actually critical for bone development. So it is intuitive then that a higher protein diet would tend to lead to improved bone mass and muscle mass. But what about the pH? And so this is where the concept of pH really falls apart. Because when we look at human studies, what we see is that higher protein diets, even if it's a crappy standard American diet, is still gonna outperform a vegan and vegetarian diet, which is full of alkaline forming foods because probably of the protein, but also potentially other factors. I think the Utah study really helps us to say that we need to eat a protein forward diet. So I think what we can take away from this is that like most things in nutrition, the simple intuitive perspective that we have around certain foods really doesn't coincide with what actually happens in the body. Humans are complex, but the body is also miraculous and amazing and incredibly intelligent. So when we go back to some of the statements that we've made as a, a, a science uh, over the last 70 years, things like cholesterol causes heart disease, cholesterol causes increased cholesterol in the blood, that's just not true. Dietary fat makes us fat, that's just not true for the most part. And I think this is true too, where acid forming foods don't necessarily make us acidic and they certainly don't obviously lead to bone loss. You can't necessarily connect one with the other. And what's really frustrating for me is that I see people then taking this out of context from the literature, but using the literature to support ideology, but then saying, well, let's avoid meat. But you heard me say that sugar alcohol and some grains are also in this acid forming group, but I don't hear a big call to avoid wine, chocolate, and bread to not have acid forming foods in your diet. So it's frustrating for me when people take this out of context to support an ideology or an agenda, when really we need to look at the big picture and say, look, we need to have an adequate protein diet. You can get that from a vegan and vegetarian diet but it is more difficult, generally requires supplementation, and I support your right to do that, but most people are gonna get this from animal products and we need to support and encourage good agriculture and regenerative agriculture process to make this available for everyone. And lastly, when you combine this with what I mentioned in my what's the best diet for osteoporosis video, we wanna have this good quality protein sources that you're then combining with fruits and vegetables. So I'm not opposed to eating alkalizing foods or alkaline forming foods. I think that you should eat those things and it's better for the body to eat those things. I just don't think that it's probably from the pH associated with those foods. So we want to eat a low inflammatory diet. If you want to put a label on it, it's probably something like the Mediterranean diet that is protein forward, lots of fruits and vegetables that you can tolerate. And again, it is good to eat alkaline forming foods, but probably not for the pH effect. All right, so thank you for making it to the end of this video. If you enjoyed this content, or even if you didn't, I would encourage you to subscribe to this channel if you're interested in learning more about your bone health. If this was offensive, then I apologize, but I hope that you can use this information to help you to push forward on your journey for your own bone health. 
If you know anybody that would benefit from this information, please share it with them. And I wanna hear from you. Please comment. If you have comments about this information, if you have questions about this information, if you have other topics that you'd like to learn more about, please leave those in the comment section below. And lastly, if you wanna learn more about how to manage osteoporosis, look in the description and sign up for our free masterclass. I'll see you there.